I'm delighted today to introduce um, a very special guest, Dr. Trinity Bivalacqua. Um, Trinity is the Christian Evanson Professor of Urology and Oncology at the Johns Hopkins Hospital. He is Director of Urologic Oncology at the James Buchanan Brady Urological Institute. He received his undergraduate degree medical as well as a PhD in pharmacology from Tulane University and completed a urology residence at Johns Hopkins. He has a clinical subspecialty interest in prostate and bladder cancer, as well as sexual dysfunction. He has a basic translational research lab, which is mainly focusing on urothelial carcinoma and regenerative medicine, uh, supported by very important uh, peer-reviewed grant funding. He is the previous recip recipient of the AUA Rising Star in Urology Research Award, AUA Leadership Class, and Gold Cystoscope Award, and I could go on and on, but then that will take away the time of his lecture. So he is talking to us today about optimizing functional outcomes following urological surgery. We all think that we are wonderful surgeons, that we don't have side effects, we don't have complications, and uh, patients recover uh, very well, and yet he's gonna tell us today about how to improve that as a blueprint for future practice. Practice. Enjoy the talk, and uh, Dr. Bivalacqua, thank you again for agreeing to speak to us today. Hello, my name is Trinity Bivalacqua, and I'm a urologist at Johns Hopkins, and it's my pleasure today to present, and once again, thank you very much to Baus uh, for this kind invitation. These are my disclosures. So at the current time, uh, we approach surgery in a number of ways. Obviously, we have uh, the uh, open approach where we attack our um, uh, various disease states, uh, the uh, open penile surgery, scrotal surgery, kidney surgery. But more importantly, we've now moved to a lot of our uh, uh, surgeries are performed via the surgical robot. Postoperatively, we currently use a number of different ways to improve our functional outcomes after urologic surgery. In particular, different pharmacological medications to improve functional outcomes, as well as uh, ERAS, or enhanced after surgery pathways. However, the reality is, is that we can do much better than we have done in the past or are currently doing. The introduction of the surgical ro robot has improved our outcomes, but ultimately we need to be able to do more to restore normal organ function postoperatively. I'd like to introduce the topic of restorative therapies. This is a form of regenerative medicine that replaces or regenerates human cells, tissues, or organs to restore or establish normal function. Restorative therapies is a form of regenerative medicine that uses a number of technologies function. I'd like to spend the next 30 minutes talking to you about different approaches that have been used in the urinary system. So why should we use regenerative therapy in urology? Well, at the current time, uh, endogenously repaired tissue has a function of loss after surgeries like prostatectomy. N neuronal uh, innervation is disrupted, uh, muscle in the pelvic floor is destroyed or injured, and therefore you have an end stream uh, phenotype such as erectile dysfunction and urinary incontinence. There are intrinsic repair mechanisms that can be honed via regenerative medicine to restore organ function. Stem cell-based therapies have been introduced in the past. And at this point, using a stem cell approach, we could stop or slow down um, uh, the uh, degradation of muscle and nerves postoperatively. And this can be done after a number of surgeries. Ideally, we'd like to use autolog autologous tissue to uh, restore normal organ, organ function in our patients postoperatively. So here is the different ways that we can use regenerative medicine in urology. This is just a snapshot of various techniques using tissue replacement, which in this case could be actually um, allograft or transplantation. We can use gene therapy or stem, stem cell therapy approaches to, to improve continence, erectile function, and restore and, and reverse stricture disease or fibrosis. Tissue engineering is where we would replace whole organs. And we can also use restorative therapy to 
um, to restore innervation, endothelial function, and muscle function of the bladder, penis, and the like. So I'll spend the next uh, couple of minutes going, uh, going over how we've utilized this in urology and how we can do it in the future. Erectile dysfunction is, in, is, a, is a good example of a disease state in which we could use uh, restorative therapies. At the current time, we are treating erectile dysfunction as a symptom. If we have mild erectile dysfunction, we use pills, which is highly effective. If we have moderate or to severe, we can use injection therapies. But could we come up with a, a form of restorative therapy that could reverse the severe erectile dysfunction that ultimately leads to a penile prosthesis? And I think the ideal place to do this is post-prostatectomy. So what are forms of restorative therapies in sexual medicine? I'll introduce the concept of platelet-rich plasma, stromal vascular fraction, which is a form of stem cell therapy, and the attic fluid are actual stem, stem, stem cells uh, de novo. However, we understand that there are a number of regulatory pathways and hurdles to use stem cell therapy. Uh, for erectile dysfunction because it's a quality of life disorder. So I think it's more realistic to be utilizing autologous tissue from a patient to restore normal organ function. The ideal delivery uh, for this would be via an intracavernosal injection, just like if you were given pharmacotherapy, or local application on the neurovascular bundle, for example, at the time of radical prostatectomy. So what is the clinical evidence for restorative therapies? or biologics uh, that can be used in combination with new technologies, such as low intensity shockwave therapy, which actually brings or hones stem cells to the, uh, to the site of injury of the penis or the pelvic floor. So what evidence do we have for this clinically? We've got plenty of preclinical evidence, but what is, is highly prevalent, especially in the United States as well as in the United Kingdom. And I'll show you some data for it's an autologous, autologous uh, biologic, which is, which is obtained via venopuncture. You spin down your, uh, the um, uh, serum, and you're able to isolate the plasma-rich um, uh, the, the plasma, plasma from, uh, platelet-rich plasma, excuse me, uh, from your venopuncture. This is then given directly uh, into uh, the uh, site of origin, for example, used for cosmetic surgery, but in our case, could be injected into the penis to restore erectile function. And this is because it releases growth factors to uh, bring in new blood vessels uh, and, and potentially nerves to restore uh, vascular dysfunction. But what's the evidence clinically? Well, actually, there is no evidence. There is no randomized controlled trials, and there's actually no uh, good clinical studies that look at endpoints that, that would show that this is um, effective. However, it's being used throughout the world, especially in Europe, in Australia, as well as in the United States and North America for things like erectile dysfunction with no evidence. And this is because it's actually a uh, 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 fee for service. Something that ha does have evidence for it to work is actually stromal vascular fraction, which is a, which is a form of, um, uh, which is obtained from autologous um, adipose uh, tissue via uh, an excision or by uh, liposuction, in which stromal vascular fraction has a number of growth factors and cytokines that actually are able to restore and promote tissue repair, angiogenesis, and prevent apoptosis. It actually hones stem cells to the site of injury. This can easily be done by a number of isolators. This is an example of one from tissue genesis in which you're able to isolate the stromal vascular fraction from uh, autologous adipose tissue from a patient, go through a number of different processing steps, and then actually place, um, and then actually inject or engraft a, um, a, a biomaterial for organ replacement. In this case, it's just injected into the penis. We, we have recently shown uh, some data to support its use. We've, a phase 2B trial was performed in which we injected uh, stromal vascular fraction into the penis post prostatectomy. And what we found in this study was that it was safe. This was a safety trial. It was, it was not powered to look at efficacy. But from this trial, we were able to show that this was safe and actually had a small signal or, or uh, improvement in erectile, uh, erectile function in some patients that received this treatment. 
We then designed a phase 2A and phase 2B trial in which we would randomize patients to actually uh, a placebo um, or sham uh, and, and then have a crossover. However, uh, the, with, when we went to the FDA, they actually were, were, were willing to approve this trial. However, funding was stopped uh, via the company. And unfortunately, the trial will not go on. So this brings us to the point that these types of technologies are very difficult to do and maybe may, and may not actually be uh, applicable to, um, uh, to, to, to the, a larger group. So we have to think about next generation therapies where we can actually inject, for example, a cytokine that we can obtain uh, commercially that actually hones or brings in uh, stem cells to the sites of injury. One example of this is str uh, stromal-derived factor one or SDF1, which is upregulated in multiple tissues after injury. And it's actually a potent stem cell chemoattractant, which, which prevents apoptosis, promotes angiogenesis, and has a number of neurotrophic uh, properties. We've recently shown that if you inject this into the penis, uh, that you're able to show, you're able to actually increase stem cell uh, chemoattraction to the neurovascular bundle or major pelvic ganglion. This is in a preclinical model. But this points to the, to the fact that you could actually do this potentially in humans and combine this with other therapies. And this is not, actually not stem cells, but a cytokine that is easily approved and safe. Another potential method is to actually combine it with a hydrogel, and then you can place this on the neurovascular bundle at the time of retroprostectomy. I think this is more of a future application, but direct injection is something that's feasible now. So how could we utilize um, uh, this SDF1 or stem cell chemoattractant? Well, actually, uh, endogenously, when we utilize low intensity shockwave therapy at low um, uh, intensity or doses for the management of ED, that's exactly what we think could be happening. The theoretical mechanism of action in, in, in which low intensity shockwave therapy occurs is by bringing in these uh, recruitment of stem cells that, re that promote uh, neuronal uh, or prevent neuronal injury, causes new uh, blood vessels, angiogenesis, and brings in these stem cells. We see here from a study that looks at the durability of low intensity shockwave therapy for erectile dysfunction. And we can see very clearly that patients that have severe ED, our target population, they do not have a durable effect to this form of uh, technology or restorative therapy. So how can we improve upon this? Well, we can improve upon this by doing a number of things, by increasing the dosing regimen. So we, you're actually having multiple doses over long period of time, where you actually have a maintenance therapy for, uh, for this intent, uh, low intensity shockwave. You can use electromagnetic or electrohydrolytic. We actually don't know what uh, the best uh, form is, and we actually don't know what device is the best. We, we don't know the role of maintenance therapy. So I think future studies are looking at this in, in a number of clinical trials currently. But really, I think the future would remain, would, 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 um, uh, would involve, excuse me, the form of restorative therapies like gene-based therapies like SDF1, combined with neurotrophic factors. And you would combine this with low intensity shockwave therapy over a period of time, potentially months to years, to, uh, to restore normal organ function. This is something that's actually feasible to be done in, in multiple uh, clinical practice of neurology. However, there's an ugly side of restorative therapies for ED, and that's the fact that, that shockwave therapy is abused. It's actually not FDA approved here in the United States, and, there, and we really don't know the, what the, the real evidence for it is. Uh, however, uh, it is being utilized and actually, once again, fee-for-service. We look here at the global use of PRP, which is platelet-rich plasma. Remember, this is an autologous a form of restorative therapy that has no evidence to work in the clinical setting. And you can see here in the United States that there's over 610 uh, clinics that are doing this off-label uh, with no evidence. And you can see one of the, in, in, the U, in the UK, there's actually a number of uh, clinics that are also doing this. So unfortunately, we have to, we have to know that, that what we are uh, proposing uh, can be abused. So moving on to tissue engineering, this is where we can actually completely replace organ function. And, and this can be done in a number of reconstructive uh, arenas. So what does tissue engineering involve? It involves a mixture of, in, of the following. 
biological components such as uh, uh, epithelial cells, endogenous epithelial cells, stem cells potentially, they can actually be ge genetically modified ex vivo. You then implant this onto a biological or uh, bio biomaterial or, or a polymer or scaffold, and this can then be um, implanted into uh, uh, humans or preclinical models to look at complete organ replacement. The obvious place to do this is the urethra of a ureter. And in, in our case, we attempted to, to make a neo-urinary conduit to completely replace um, a, a, um, a, the, the ileal conduit for urinary diversion. In urinary diversions, the most common uh, form of diversion is ileal conduit. We use we, typically a bricker ileal conduit, ileal loop is utilized. However, uh, we know that this actually is associated with significant um, uh, side effects when we use uh, the uh, small bowel. In the United States, as well as in the EU, the most common urinary diversion is actually an incontinent diversion or ileal conduit with over 20,000 cases done annually, both in the United States and in the EU. So could we come up with a way to avoid the use of small bowel to, uh, to prevent these side effects? So we hypothesized that, that uh, the sustained and significant complications associated with the absorptive G, GI tract, tract to urine uh, really is the cause of the side effects from our um, uh, patients undergoing uh, radical cystectomy and urinary diversion. So could we come up with a urinary reconstruction using autologous um, uh, cell sources to tissue engineer a urinary conduit or potentially a bladder in the future? to uh, replace that of, uh, of small bowel. This is the concept. I will not show you the preclinical data that, that supported this, but we were able to show that preclinically, we can, we can obtain adipose derived smooth muscle cells. We can expand these um, ex vivo, implant them onto a biomaterial. And, at the, and after a radical cystectomy, we're able to uh, uh, place this into uh, patients. And the question that we proposed in a phase one trial, could we, actually make a neo-urinary conduit that was functional and, and, was, uh, and with less side effects. This was a phase one trial. This was approved in the United States. Um, uh, there were 10 patients that were uh, proposed. These, this was done at two sites, both at Johns Hopkins and the University of Chicago. Um, these were patients undergoing a radical cystectomy for either non-muscle invasive bladder cancer refractory to intravesical therapy or for muscle invasive disease. New adjuvant chemotherapy was approved. And the primary endpoint of this was safety and feasibility of the surgical technique, as well as conduit integrity and patency at one year. There were a number of translational challenges. Number one, could we, did we have the right biomaterial to do this uh, trial? We use a form of uh, collagen-based uh, material called PLGA, which is very common in a number of tissue-engineered urinary um, uh, tissue engineered um, urinary tract um, uh, trials that were performed uh, around, the, uh, around the world. Uh, we identified we, uh, autologous cell sources. Uh, we did not want to use stem cells or urethelial cells from the bladder because these were bladder cancer patients and we were fear of carcinogenesis. And we used the, the omentum as our blood supply to, uh, to provide adequate blood supply for this to, to completely regenerate. We enrolled eight patients. Uh, we did not hit our primary endpoint of 10, and I'll explain why in a minute. The first two patients were done at the University of Chicago, and the remaining six patients were done at Johns Hopkins. You can see here that these are patients uh, that, are, uh, that, have been, that have received intravesical therapy, patients with muscle invasive disease, uh, receiving uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy, as well as adjuvant chemotherapy. So we, what, what this demonstrates is this is a heterogeneous uh, bladder cancer practice, consistent with what um, most patients with bladder cancer undergo cystectomy. What we found was is that our average length of stay in the hospital was 5.6 days. But I'll point out that patients were having a return of bowel function on postoperative day one. Three patients at our cohort actually uh, died, two from, uh, from urethelial cancer and one from a myocardial infarction four weeks after surgery. Um, actually, it was five weeks, uh, and this was not related to the, uh, our, our surgical implant. And the, all of the, uh, the neourinary conduits had contracture with stoma stenosis or actually stricture of the, of the urinary, neourinary conduit and required explantation. The average enough lifespan was 250 days. 
We obtained a fat biopsy from the abdominal wall. We grew adipose derived smooth muscle cells, uh, ex vivo. We implanted them on a biodegradable PLGA scaffold, Im implanted it after a patient underwent a radical cystect cystectomy with limb venerectomy. This was done four weeks after the fat biopsy. This is us in the operating room, actually uh, perform, uh, wrapping the neurourinary conduit with omentum to provide the blood supply. Our clinical pathway was, uh, was, that, uh, was the same as that of most cystectomy patients. We performed a Wallace ureteral anastomosis. We did not perform a bricker because we were trying to reduce the risk of uh, ureteral stricture. We uh, wrapped the neurourinary conduit with omentum. Ureteral stents and stoma catheters were utilized and they were removed four to six weeks later. All NUCs were implanted and ileoconduit urinary diversions were performed uh, without uh, consequence. So what are the clinical results? So this will highlight the surgical ad adaptations and the functionality of the doctor. I can summarize the, the results here uh, in this uh, schematic. You can see here that the first two patients uh, actually, uh, we, we did not provide adequate blood supply with either peritoneum or omentum, and they were actually explanted less than three months. However, when we made changes in the, uh, in the surgical technique in which we used omentum from the, from the tip where it came out to the uh, skin on the abdominal wall down to the ureteral um, uh, anastomosis, we were able to get better blood supply. However, this was still not adequate. And in patient three is a good example of how at, at, at month six, due to contractures secondary to ischemia, uh, they had uh, upper tract deterioration. Despite our um, uh, modifications, uh, patients, five, six, seven, but patients five, seven, and eight also had um, uh, a decline in their upper tract function. And I'll show that now. Patient number three um, had, uh, was admitted for right flank pain, had a percutaneous nephrostomy tube placed. And what we found was you do in a loopogram, a ureteroscopy, that the neourinary conduit had contracted and we caught, and there was stomal stenosis at the skin. The patient lived with a, a, a nephrostomy tube, hoping that we would be able to dilate the tract. However, this was not successful, and the patient underwent a successful ileal loop. Patient five had a very similar outcome. They did make it to a uh, month 10. However, this was, um, this was, uh, this ultimately uh, had the same result, which was uh, contracture um, and uh, upper tract deterioration. Here's an example of what happens at the um, ileal, at the uh, ureteral, at the skin where the neourinary conduit is brought. You can see you have a nice open stoma here with the stoma catheter, but as soon as we remove the stents as well as the stoma, we see contracture at the skin. So there was problems at the stoma. So if we look at the histology of the neourinary conduit, this demonstrated robust regeneration of urinary tissue and actually new blood vessels and innervation. So from a tissue engineered standpoint, from a regenerative medicine standpoint, we actually were able to regenerate uh, new urinary tissue as early as five to seven weeks. This is an example of my patient that it was actually had the NUC explanted at week five to five. You can see here uh, the neourinary conduit through the abdominal wall. Here is actually where the ureters came in. This is where it is at the skin. You can see here that there is significant growth of uh, of uh, new muscle as early as five to seven weeks. And we see uh, early uh, growth of urethelial lining of the neurourinary conduit. And once again, this patient um, unfortunately passed due to a myocardial infarction, but he allowed us to be able to, his, his uh, spouse allowed us to do that. The next patient uh, actually made it to 10 months. Uh, we had to explant the NUC, and you can see here that the neurourinary conduit is now significantly contracted. It, it became nine centimeters. Actually, histologically, a good urethelial lining with nice robust muscle, but there was a significant contracture, and unfortunately, it was not durable, not functional. We did see new innervation of this neourinary conduit. So if I showed you just the histology slides, this would suggest that we had a successful um, uh, regeneration and uh, it would be our tissue engineered approach. However, this neourinary conduit was not functional and it actually uh, contracted due to fibrosis. And therefore, uh, overall, um, it was not a success as it relates to functional outcomes. So we successfully regenerated urinary tissue. Unfortunately, we were not able to translate our, um, to, from our preclinical model to that in the human condition. 
Um, and what we're now doing is, is looking at new biomaterials and new approaches to uh, improve uh, the functional outcomes of urinary conduit. So I think this is an example of where we can move things to help reduce side effects from surgery, for example, in radical cystectomy, but by using a small bowel. However, we're really far away from that happening. What about something more uh, feasible? What about stricture disease? This is a common problem, both in the United States as well as around the world. We, get it, we have a number of individuals um, between 220 to 627 new cases per 100,000 individuals um, uh, had developed narrowing of the, of the lumen of the urethra and developed stricture disease. It's expensive. Um, and the etiology is usually infectious, trauma, or iatrogenic. Ag Urethropathy is actually very successful, uh, whereas uh, dilation or urethrotomy is less successful. We see that an, uh, anastomotic urethroplasties are the most successful. But, however, augmentation urethroplasties are those that are used uh, most, most often for those with severe stricture disease. Our one-stage approach uses things like the, a buccal grass as well as a number of other grafts that have been uh, proposed in the literature. Two-stage urethroplasties um, are done with people who have a larger defects where we tubulize the graft. And we oftentimes need to use um, uh, grafts like the buccal mucosa and then use it as an onlay. However, this is taking, um, a, a doing a, a additional surgery um, and potentially side effects that result from this. Now, albeit very unlikely and very low, but could we actually uh, replace this with, um, with a tissue engineered approach? I'd like to point out that the success rate for these, both the ventral and dorsal, is about 80%. So, if we were able to use new materials and actually seed this with, with things like epithelial cells from the buccal mucosa potentially or from the uh, lining of the, of, the, of, the, uh, of the bladder, would this also um, serve as a replacement and actually take away the attempt of using a second um, uh, host tissue? There are a number of preclinical studies that have been done and actually uh, I'll show you the results of one clinical trial. Here's a proposal that we put together for making urethra. We can make a number of different collagen-based scaffolds, and then there are a number of different uh, cell seeding that, that could be performed. This is a trial that was done out of Germany in which they used um, off-the-shelf, actually, um, a biomaterial that was seeded with uh, a buccal um, uh, epithelial buccal uh, cells. And you can see here in this top panel, patients that underwent one failed urethroplasty actually had an 80% success rate with uh, this uh, approach uh, using tissue engineered um, uh, tissue up to two years and, and a very good comparable 70% um, uh, with those patients that had two or three different failures. So I think this demonstrates that this is feasible and an example of how this can be used more, uh, more readily in clinical practice. And I think this is something that you're going to see coming about uh, sooner than later. Now looking at actual tissue replacement. And this is another form of regenerative urology. Um, in the United States, there's a lot of patients, uh, excuse me, a lot of military, as well as around the world, that have uh, traumatic injuries. 5% of all traumatic injuries um, are a uh, result of GU tract, and the external genitalia is the most common site. It, at, at Johns Hopkins, we actually um, uh, in, embarked on a um, allograph, a penile allograph, uh, uh, penile transplant uh, program. Uh, this is our group, uh, and we performed the first uh, uh, penile transplant or abdominal oil transplant in a patient who actually had um, a, had uh, a injury uh, to the uh, scrotum and lost uh, his phallus in, in our rock. So here's. Uh, uh, an example of how we came together uh, to come up with a way to, um, uh, to use the penis and, and uh, do a penile transplant. However, there are a number of ethics around penile transplant. The group in South Africa, as well as in Boston, have, have already performed first transplants. However, theirs uh, were, was with patients that had at least a portion of the penis still present. Our patient had complete loss of, of so we had to do a complete abdominal wall and penile scrotal transplant. However, there's a number of ethics around transplantation, especially as it relates to the genitalia. This is, um, this is a, a quality of life uh, dis, uh, uh, disorder in, in, a, in a way. However, I think uh, most people would uh, uh, agree 
and this is kind of up for debate, uh, and, and, and there's a lot of discussion around this, that, that patients should have their own autonomy to make human, basic human rights as it relates to uh, their body. And, and if they are willing to take a potential um, a risk for quality of life disorders, then we should not stand in their way. Additionally, we would be giving immunosuppression to patients uh, long-term that do not, um, that have a quality of life disorder. Um, and what we've done is, and, and others have tried to come up with new approaches to reduce immunosuppression. So for patients that get, for example, a penile transplant, we have a number of things that we have to uh, keep, keep in consideration. So this has to be um, the ideal candidate. So what are the indications for penile transplant? Well, trauma is the most common. In South Africa, that, uh, the patients that were transplanted there were due to circumcision injuries. In our case, we had military service with complete loss of the uh, penis and scrotum due to traumatic injury. Uh, the transplant that was done in Boston was done for penile cancer. I think there's ethics around putting a cancer patient on immunosuppression. And I think what we're gonna see more of is congenital um, uh, conditions, such as bladder extrophy, where you have almost complete loss of the uh, penis in some patients, or things like androgen insufficiency syndrome with, with a uh, small uh, phallus. And ultimately, there is a possibility for potential tra transgender. What we did was we performed a number of uh, cadaveric studies to understand the anatomy. And from this, we were able to come up with the, uh, both the innervation as well as the vascular supply to the abdominal wall, to the penis and scrotum in order for us to perform the penile uh, scrotum transplant. Our patient was a military vet veteran. Um, he lost his uh, phallus secondary to a blast injury. There were multiple abdominal surgeries, pelvic surgeries, and he had a bilateral, he has a bilateral AKA. Preoperatively, uh, we performed a CT scan to understand the vascular anatomy. This is a schematic of the actual transplant. Uh, there were over 10 vascular anastomoses that were performed by our colleagues in plastic surgery. This was a team approach in which we had uh, both uh, plastics with their um, with doing the uh, vascular anastomosis with urology that were doing the uh, corporal and urethroplasty. Myself and Dr. Bud Burnett here at Johns Hopkins were the urologists uh, that performed that portion of the operation. Here you can see how the phallus and abdominal wall uh, were um, uh, transplanted. Our paper was uh, published last year in the New England Journal of Medicine. Here is an actual um, uh, picture um, of the, of the, uh, of the donor uh, abdominal wall, as well as scrotum and phallus, as you can see here. Uh, this, is, uh, this is our patient's abdominal wall, where you can see where, we, where the transplanted uh, uh, skin from the, uh, and scrotum and penis were placed. And this is actually about one year later um, uh, with, um, uh, as you can see, how uh, it is still, um, the graft is intact. He has had no signs of rejection, uh, and he has good um, uh, functional outcome. Uh, and without any signs of stricture and the like. So this is an example of a successful uh, transplantation. So penile transplant offers improved cosmesis and function. This is a vascularized composite allograft. It takes a significant amount of time and effort to set up a GU tissue vascularized composite allotransplantation protocol. And for us, it took many years. The inherent bias and ethics remain to be overcome for penile vascularized composite allograft transplantation. However, um, thinking about the, about the future, this may be potential options. Just like in the beginning of uh, kidney transplantation, there were, there were ethics around that, and there were a lot of failures. Ultimately, I do think that this is possible at centers of excellence, especially in the UK, where you can have um, centralization of care, uh, and, and patients could ultimately uh, come to one or two centers throughout the UK to, uh, to have, uh, a, that has a nice GU tissue um, allotransplantation protocol in place. So in conclusion, restorative therapies should have a vital role in our clinical practice in the next decade, with pivotal trials showing ideal approaches in patient populations. I think that this is most likely to occur in things in, in patients with uh, functional outcomes or improvements, like improvement of urinary uh, incontinence, stress urinary incontinence in women, uh, post-prostatectomy erectile dysfunction, and uh, stress urinary incontinence. I think this is something that we can come up with different approaches that can be utilized um, uh, around the world, and in particular, in normal clinical practice. 
Things like tissue engineering and urologic surgery is yet to be determined, the role it is. However, early studies, especially in urethroplasty, uh, where you can use um, over-the-counter uh, 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 biomaterials and, and, and implant them with uh, biopsies, for example, of the bucking mucosa, have great promise. And once again, I do believe that this is feasible. Um, I think the early studies in reconstructive urology show that this proof of, uh, of, of principle. And I think our, our um, uh, trials, where we tried to completely replace an organ, where we made a new urinary conduit, I think the durability of this was, was, was not possible due to a number of factors, including um, uh, ischemia-associated uh, fibrosis, uh, as well as biomaterials that just degraded and, and caused fibrosis. So we're making a number of different um, adaptations to uh, improve this uh, in the future. Now, as far as GU tissue vascularized um, allotransplantation or allografts or, or transplants, I think that this is only going to be feasible in select sites uh, in centers around the world. However, I think we should be uh, moving towards this because our current approach is where we're, we're doing the same types of surgery. It doesn't matter if we're doing them it be an open approach or robotic approach. I know our techniques are sound and we make wonderful improvements in our, in our patient outcomes. However, we need to do better. And things like restorative therapies, as well as in combination, for example, pharmacological therapies and tissue engineering is no doubt the way of the future. I'd like to thank everybody for listening, listening to me and for inviting me uh, to do this um, a virtual presentation. Um, uh, I wish I could be there with everyone uh, in, in, in the UK at Baus, uh, but I look forward to next year in person. Thank you very much.